have become and thank the distinguished panelists of South Asian origin in the USA and from Pakistan and India for our discussion. I'm also thankful to all of those, uh, my friends and others, who have joined us for this important discussion. As you know, this year, uh, the US uh, presidential election is turning out to be a typical election to say it mildly. But we believe and hope that the well-grounded US system will take care of it. If there are any inconsistencies or irregularities, <coughs> that might happen during this election. With the spread and increase of COVID-19, we are all facing unusual times. But hope is always there. Along with us in the USA, the world is also anxious watching us or watching this election, the US election. Today, our uh, discussion is mainly focused on the impact on South Asia about the election, the US election impact on South Asia. And we are here uh, gathered to discuss and find any uh, solution if we have in our mind uh, for these concerns. Let me give you a little brief uh, about the this organization. We have uh, started this organization in 2015, just the last, before the last elections. And we started our first function from the, uh, the before the election in 2016. We started in November 2015, and then we had uh, the first uh, discussion on U.S. elections in uh, just before the third of November. And since then, we have been doing all uh, every uh, now and then, every six months after every six months or five months or uh, we, we organize uh, discussion in library, library in Virginia. So, uh, and now we are, we are working on some training program for the journalists. Mainly we, we focus on the journalism in South Asia. So we are now going to do some training programs for the journalists in South Asia and those who need to learn something uh, about the journalism because you know every day the journalism has changed a lot now. So we need to give those uh, new ideas to them who cannot, don't have, who have not achieved that. Let me introduce you to our team of experts and professionals. They are all, we are all together from the day one for this uh, organization. And I, when I name you, please just raise your hand. Alice Siraj, is for, he's a former World Bank official. He has been very helpful uh, in writing our bylaws and everything he has been doing with us. Then John Lennon, he is a former uh, broadcaster executive from the Voice of America. He has been the, from the day one, or just before I started, he was and he, he had helped us a lot. Mariam Sabi is a journalist, analyst, and public speaker. Then Nadim Hotiana, he is a press. Former press, uh, former press minister from India of Pakistan, and they, these people, they are all very intellectually. They have been very helpful to us. Then comes Faria Rahman. She is a rising star in the field of journalism, a young aspiring journalist. Fazia Shtak is a social worker and political act activist, and of course Anwar Iqbal a veteran journalist, a writer, analyst, and he will be the MC in today's discussion program. So Anwar, now to you. Uh, Bismillah Rahman Rahim, thank you very much. And since you already introduced all of them, I think I should avoid uh, doing double introduction and just ask them to speak uh, with brief remarks. Uh, briefly to see Faria, 
with Faz Rahman, uh, Mr. Hotiana. Uh, we have uh, known him forever. We attended Ghalib's Mushara and Badu Shah Zafar's Darbar together. We used to be at home for a long time. Uh, Miriam Sabi uh, is, well, she's also, I mean, she, well, she's no more arriving. She's an established yeah. uh, a speaker. And she is a star. Some of you I don't know. Mr. Pitafi, Farooq Pitafi. So, who our first speaker today is uh, John Lennon. Normally, I've uh, I've heard about him about what's happening in the view today and how long does he think it will stay afloat and will the Trump administration be able to close it down? But I will not because this does not concern him. So I start with Lennon and such a illustrious last name. I mean, I, it reminds me of my days when I was a fan of John Lennon, the singer. So, Mr. Lennon, please. Thank you very much. Um, I, I would start by saying that it's a, it's a genuine pleasure and an honor for me to be a part of this discussion today. Uh, as, as Nuzaira has indicated, I've been uh, working with uh, my colleagues on the establishment of the Global Wheat Foundation since the beginning, and it's been a very exciting uh, adventure uh, for me, uh, holding out a great deal of promise. The reason that's true is because I spent uh, the the 45 years as, uh, at the Voice of America, and during that time worked with journalists from all over the world, uh, including journalists from India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, and, and throughout Asia. Uh, and I know how much um, I know how much value journalism has for that part of the world. And when I had the opportunity to join Nuzaira and her colleagues in developing journalism training programs, I found that a, uh, a very welcome challenge. So it's been a great honor for me to be a part of all of that, and I look forward uh, to the future. And speaking of the future, uh, I think we're going to talk today about the, uh, the presidential election in the United States. Yudaira has said it exactly right. Uh, this is a very difficult election. The most um, contentious, I think, uh, in my adult lifetime and according to historians, going back almost to the Civil War, we have, have had uh, Donald Trump as president. He has been controversial uh, even before he became president of the United States, and that continues today. Uh, we also have uh, some, some issues, which we're going to discuss, I think, today, that have to do with conditions in the United States among the voting population. Uh, and they don't come in, a, in order, first, second, third, rather it's a group. Uh, one of these is, is um, race relations in the United States. There's a tremendous amount of pressure. We've all read about the demonstrations, Black Lives Matter, and the grievances that uh, the African American community uh, has expressed. We also have uh, a, a, an economy which is staggering under the weight of the pandemic. And the pandemic is a separate issue, of course, but the economy is one which is affecting the lives of tens of millions of people. And more than 60 million people are on unemployment right now, which is, it's not unprecedented in terms of proportion, but it is a staggering uh, burden for, for the population of this country. The pandemic itself, of course, is an enormous issue many people, many people blame Donald Trump uh, for uh, the, the uh, ca ca catastrophic impact. More than uh, almost 220,000 people have died in this country. And I know that the, the numbers in, in South Asia are going up rapidly. So this is a universal issue, uh, but it is very much an issue here in terms of what the federal government, the national government of the United States should be doing. So. We've got a lot to talk about. I will stop talking. I thank you again for inviting me to take part in this panel discussion. Uh, and I look forward to hearing what we all have to say. Oh, man, this one thing I'm not clear about, are we supposed to ask questions now or shall we wait for all the speakers to speak? Towards the end, 
we, I mean, it was decided that because we would be having questions towards the end. After everybody has spoken. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, next speaker is Mr. Kafi. Uh, are you in, uh, this is the advantage I take, I'm being old. I have the advantage of calling everybody by their first names. So, Farooq, are you in? No, sir, I'm in a town, sir. There will be last night. No, Bob, but you are monitoring what is happening in Karachi right now, right? Right now, on my screen at this moment, yeah. So, That's how it. do you think it would? I mean, I think this is something you probably would talking about. So, how do you think this election in the United States would impact politics in Pakistan or in South Asia? Well, thank you very much sir, for uh, your uh, uh, that that important segue. Let me start with uh, actually introducing South Asia once again to everybody. South Asia is more uh, a closed system. Uh, if you look at our television channels, there will hardly be any international news. I know India uh, does a, a bit better in this context, but India is self-absorbed. Uh, so uh, every time India is mentioned, maybe India or Indian channels will actually report on that, otherwise not. Uh, so uh, at this moment, uh, it is quite interesting because uh, uh, you can see that uh, right now the kind of world order or lack of uh, world order that we see uh, is amazing. You have seeds of all kind of disruption that is, that is possible. Uh, hardline is all over the place. Uh, uh, all countries being actually governed by that. So it can always, uh, uh, provided there is a big disruption, it can lead to some kind of confrontation uh, to the international proportion. Uh, but regardless of that, I, I tell you, uh, this time uh, I don't see South Asians paying that much attention to the U.S. elections uh, in comparison to 2016. Uh, there are two reasons. One, um, in 2016, we had Hillary Clinton uh, versus uh, uh, Donald Trump. Donald Trump was unknown quantity and his uh, words were uh, like very aggressive at that time. So most of the people at that, at that time thought, uh, took a position one way or the other. But this time, uh, uh, Donald Trump has said the word for something like uh, almost four years, and uh, 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 Biden has been uh, 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 vice president for eight years. So there is less of an interest. And this intrigues me because uh, I thought that given that uh, Kamala Harris is uh, running as uh, Biden's uh, uh, running mate, there will be more interest in this election. But it doesn't seem to be that, uh, that kind of case. Uh, regarding uh, South Asian politics and geopolitics, I tell you, um, I believe that uh, it has less to do with the U.S. elections and more to do with the changing order. The way technology is gradually displacing a lot of things, the fact that we all are shut, shut in most of the time because of a, 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 a pandemic and the fact that uh, China is also rising. So there are so many things that are happening that I don't see a U.S. president asserting or shaping the world the way it used to be in the past. Um, um, I say this because at this moment there seems to be a push for a decoupling between uh, the U.S. and China. And of course, India will be interested in that because India sees itself as a counterweight to China. But I, I believe that at this moment the kind of circumstances we are living in, in that uh, uh, whosoever comes in power, these dynamics are now totally transformed. Donald Trump actually brought in uh, a transactional nature to international relations. Uh, Pakistan was accustomed to that. The rest of the world perhaps was not. But now, uh, I call it global Pakistan. Now you have transactional relationship with everybody. So I believe that Joseph Biden comes in or uh, Donald Trump stays in, uh, things are going to be more or less the same. But uh, before I uh, actually conclude, uh, let me very quickly tell you that while this is the perception, most of uh, the most important things that we are not maybe paying that much attention to might actually have a different kind of world in uh, five to six years or ten years. Uh, for example, this uh, uh, Boogaloo movement, uh, QAnon, uh, QAnon, uh, and uh, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, this kind of push 
uh, threatens because America still is uh, the capital of world culture. It actually threatens world uh, not by bring, making it a bipolar political reality, but a bipolar mental place where uh, everybody is fighting with everybody else. Uh, right now, the, given that they are hardliners, there is also a possibility that it might actually lead to peace and Donald Trump has actually pushed for that from North Korea to Afghanistan, but there are major concerns. One last thing, uh, that as a South Asian, I would be more interested to see um, South Asians debating uh, the future of South Asian community in the, in the U.S. rather than what happens between India and Pakistan or India and this or that or the other country. I wish we could be allies of them and in that way maybe we could have actually uh, uh, asserted or exerted more influence on, on the well-being of our own diaspora. Thank you. So the next speaker is uh... Um, Sama is from India, are you, right? Yes, yes. Good evening, everyone. You are in India, right? Yes, yes. I am, I am uh, from India. So is the interest in the U.S. in India is as much or as less as it is in Pakistan or it is what the India is slightly more interested in English? Okay. Uh, uh, for us to understand the interest uh, of the people and the media, it is important to understand the, the media landscape in India. Uh, I would first like to highlight that India, uh, Indian media, uh, of course the influence that, that, that the Indian media governs on its people is immense, but Indian media currently um, is centered around one person's ideology, uh, who, and that person is Narendra Modi. So uh, even U.S. elections and its coverage in India is, is governed by what Narendra Modi has to say and his point of view. So his friends are favored. And therefore, if you see that the, the, whole, the whole coverage of the elections is around the theatrics of Donald Trump. Um, I believe that the interest is solely about uh, what uh, Donald Trump brings to the table. And uh, Donald Trump um, has been able to uh, marry the ideology currently in India. And he's been able to bring that same thought on the table of, uh, in India because of, of the kind of uh, radicalism he, he sort of talks about. And therefore, there is a, there's a resonance and there is, there is, there's a sort of uh, uh, marrying of thoughts. Uh, between our current prime minister and his, and you know, the Howdy Modi event. There have been, there have been a couple of very, very signature events, the events that were meant to uh, be a kind of a statement, uh, have created that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of interest in, in, in Donald Trump's, uh, uh, so uh, I, uh, sorry, my cat is behind, so please ignore her. Uh, but yes, uh, the whole, the whole conversation in, in India is centered around Modi and automatically the focus is on Trump. I do believe that the Kamala Harris effect um, uh, was, was the wave that we saw and we saw the shift in people's conversations moving to Kamala Harris when the announcement happened. But eventually uh, uh, you see the entire, entire uh, circle of influence is, uh, is governed by Modi and therefore his, his friend is favored. So, um, as far as the South Asian Americans uh, are concerned, if I have to talk about the South Asian, uh, uh, the entire community, how will they influence the election? I feel that, uh, uh, you know, the Black Lives Matters, uh, the Black Lives, the entire movement has created a huge, huge momentum since June. And I think that momentum is ongoing. The whole idea that people stepped out during the pandemic is, is a reflection that you know it is it is about taking an action i was reading a very interesting article and a, a girl on the street mentioned that listen you know this is not the time to sit down and show our anger um, uh, uh, by uh, just being on the streets let us reflect and utilize this anger in the polls so and also i feel that if you can influence social media you can really change the game 
uh, Biden's picture of kneeling down with the protesters has really worked very well for him, especially in the young young voters. Therefore, I feel the, uh, that the the core uh, committed Trump's uh, 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 you know following of people who love for him for his comments and people who love him for his uh, fake tweets and for his fake news. That's only 30-40%. But this whole new wave of the unrest that we have seen in the last six months is going to be the game changer back in US. But as far as India is concerned, as far as the Indian uh, uh, space is concerned and the media is concerned, the people are concerned, I clearly see a Trump wave here in India primarily because of Trump's relationship with Narendra Modi and, uh, you know, Hindus uh, for Trump movement that became so huge on social media. So that 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 whole uh, radical uh, thoughts matching and finding the same wavelength uh, has, uh, in India at least, has become a very, very clear indicator that the media is favoring him and therefore, um, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that that's, that's the kind of way we are seeing here. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry if I take a few minutes, a few seconds to get back to you because I'm also taking down notes for my story. Uh, so the next speaker is... Uh, Misba Azam Saab. He's a PhD and analyst on social and political issues, host talk for part news show from San Jose, California. And although we have never met each other but he's on my facebook and i do see his posts and messages so mr adam please cannot hear you uh, that's good uh, everybody listen to me Yes. yes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Mursab uh, and Nuzera, uh, for uh, this uh, opportunity where uh, we can uh, share about the way we see the U.S. elections uh, impacting the very important uh, South Asian, where uh, all of us, most of us, at, at least I say, uh, sorry to John, um, all of us, not all of us, just uh, most of us belong. Uh, if we look at uh, U.S. policy towards the South Asia, South Asia, uh, it, we, we can kind of distribute different, uh, uh, different focuses of where U.S. policy works. Uh, one is the ASEAN countries. Of course, Mr. Trump is still did not uh, nominate any envoy for that, and they are not happy for that. Then comes to the South China Sea issues between U.S. and China, and of course the trade war going on. And then comes India, Pakistan, Afghanistan. And if you kindly allow me to encroach a little bit more, I would say a little bit Iran also, one of the part which the South Asian policy towards U.S. is uh, going to impact. Now the, uh, now the question is the elections in the U.S. That is the first question. Mr. Trump is for America first approach. Okay, whatever, who is doing, keep doing, and we will let me fix American problem. However, Mr. Joe Biden, he is campaigning to rebuilding America's leadership role in the global uh, institutions. So now this is the first big difference between these two candidates as I see it sitting in San Jose, California. Now, uh, South China Sea issue is nothing to do with Mr. Trump. Of course, we see a lot of trade war <coughs> going up and all, but the thing is that things were going wrong even before 2013 when uh, President Obama was president and uh, Mr. Joe Biden was his vice president. There was an incident uh, with the USS Scalpin in the South China Sea where we were close to the some kind of hot war if US 
captain commander of USS Carlton would not decide to turn. So saying that there would be too much changes uh, may not be the case. Uh, Mr. Biden would come, that would go as it is. However, there is one thing which has to be kept in mind that usually the second term U.S. presidents are more careful uh, and aggressive in some way. Somewhere they are more careful, somewhere they are more aggressive because they don't have to go for the new election. So we have yet to see if uh, President Trump re-elect uh, what he will, uh, how, how he will do. ASEAN countries, they, they, want, uh, they don't want U.S. to see the South Asia, the Southeast Asia, if, I, if you allow me to say, the Southeast Asia from the glasses of uh, China, U.S. trade war and the issue. Now comes to India, Pakistan. I would start with Pakistan. Uh, lies and deceit tweet of Trump, who can forget that? However, after that, of course, there was a cessation of U.S. security assistance to Pakistan. But if you remember, even after that, U.S. and Pakistan always found out with President Trump the some some regions where they can agree upon. And one is the biggest one was the uh, uh, Pakistan's assistance in uh, Doha. Now, when if President Biden, we would be seeing President Biden after November 3, President Biden may be a little bit more open towards their policy towards Pakistan and the excesses of India uh, because of the Kashmir issue and uh, other issue. Of course, they uh, you may have uh, heard some of the uh, uh, some days, some time ago, uh, President, uh, I mean, uh, Senator Biden and uh, Kamala Harris, they made some statement regarding the excesses in Kashmir. However, expecting that if they become a president, they will be standing up to India and telling them to you know, go and behave is not going to happen because uh, India has a huge strategic partnership with US which Pakistan does not have to that extent. There are only one concern there that India Pakistan will not go to war and when US will come out from Afghanistan there would be no issue. Now, um, I think I'm running out of my time. So one last thing I would say that President Trump, President Trump does not care too much about what will happen to Afghanistan if once the US will pull out from it. However, President Biden would be looking into keeping the peace dividend, and he would like to stay put. That is not a good news for Pakistan, if I see it uh, from uh, that point of view. Because if US troops will be there, they will be constantly being the target of the uh, factions of Taliban. And if things will go wrong, Pakistan would be blamed for not doing enough to stop uh, the movement, uh, attacks by the Taliban. And, uh, but the thing is that as far as Iran is concerned, I think uh, policy will stay the same and uh, there will be no change in that, maybe minor change here now. And then we see, we maybe start listening about the uh, Iran deal, which uh, President Obama had, but uh, more than that, it's not going to happen. So that is uh, my answer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Uh, several questions, but we'll get back to those later. I mean, there are certain things that I agree with and there are certain things that I do not. Uh, but uh, after Fahadu was Raza Rumi, but I think he's not here today. Uh, I, now I'll move on to 
Mariam Sabi. Uh, Mariam, what would you like to talk about besides uh, whatever you talk about all the time, which is you are a great Trump lover and this, you can't really think of a life in the United States without Trump. Oh gosh, that's totally, totally opposite of, of my views. But um, I think it is interesting. I think everybody brought up some uh, very interesting points. Um, Saima mentioned um, the Howdy Modi uh, event that you know took place and, and the close friendship that Modi and Trump have. Um, and um, I think it is interesting to see like um, like Modi, Trump is kind of like this movement that is unpredictable. We don't really know, like he says something, but he does something else. So um, definitely like this can have some, you know, severe consequences as, you know, we're seeing not only in our culture, the global uh, culture, as um, I think John also mentioned that, you know, the America is like a, a leader in that. And, and what happens here does affect what happens um, all across the globe. Um, including South Asia, including Europe, including, you know, Canada, every, everywhere. Um, so we are seeing this, this trend, um, uh, you know, of um, uh, racism, prejudice, and things that his movement kind of endorses in, you know, he, he says that he doesn't agree with it, but he doesn't clearly um, speak out against it. He makes excuses for, you know, extremist groups. Um, and, you know, we're seeing that in South Asia, we're seeing an increase in racism, prejudice, um, and these racial tensions in Europe um, and all over the world. Um, another thing that's happening in South Asia right now in Pakistan is this movement for democracy um, and this, uh, you know, tension between um, the military and the civilian um, you know, population. Um, and we also saw with Biden, um, you know, in the past, um, it, before it was a Kerry Luger bill, it was the Biden Luger bill. Um, and Biden has spoken out a lot for um, civilian supremacy in Pakistan. Um, I know Zardari gave him like a, you know, the, the highest medal in Pakistan for speaking out for democracy. So that's another thing we, you know, I guess um, for the South Asian community or overseas, uh, something to look at. Well, will a Biden presidency favor democracy in Pakistan? Um, will a Trump presidency, you know, be more careless? Um, I think Mizbah uh, also mentioned that um, in Afghanistan, like Trump really, you know, it, it, his own generals and other people are also saying that his policies are a bit misguided. He gave too much concessions to the Taliban. The Taliban want a Trump presidency because they find him to be honest to his words that he, you know, is delivering towards them. But um, they already announced that they want to remove all the troops before Christmas. So that has also emboldened the Taliban. And I think Pakistan, uh, according to even uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan's op-ed in the, um, I believe it was the um, Washington Post or New York Times, that he does not want them to leave, you know, just carelessly, because um, that will not be good for the region. It may be good for Trump because he can say, look, I took my troops back and, and now I don't care, it's up to them, you know, they're negotiating. If they want peace, they'll have peace. If they don't, they don't. Um, but I think Biden would offer a little bit more leadership in, in that he understands the complexities of the, you know, of South Asia. Um, the other point, I think um, Mr. Farouk made a very good point about the diaspora and, and South Asians um, you know, whether we're talking about Pakistani Americans or, you know, to focus more on our issues in America. Um, and some troubling things I have heard, I've heard, um, you know, some people in the Pakistani American community who believe that just because Kamala Harris has a background of, you know, being Indian, that she's going to favor India. And, you know, I mean, these are very troubling kind of, you know, uh, thoughts, knowing how close Modi and uh, Trump are to each other, but for people in, in the United States to ignore that um, and to focus on not that, you know, instead of looking at Kamala Harris as a um, 
as a positive thing for the South Asian community, for South Asian women, that it's giving us more opportunity, that we are, you know, uh, seeing a leader who is from our community, who is going to speak out for our rights as minorities in this country. Um, I've seen a lot of people um, speak about her background and because of her background, they would, you know, are against voting for her because they think that just because she's one fourth Indian or I don't know, has an Indian grandmother or mother that she is going to favor India instead of looking at their policies. So I think um, this is like a deep, you know, something that we need to overcome in this community um, or to talk about more like what are our issues here and why are we so, um, you know, why do we judge people in this way? So, um, you know, I think those are some interesting um, aspects to look into. Well, thank you. Yeah, we shall overcome, don't worry. So, so. Uh, now, who is next after uh, Mariam? For you, uh, you. So, um, yes, I, I think everyone here has spoken wonderfully about the connection with, you know, our presidency here in South Asia. That's not something that I would be able to completely add to. I'm working in local news in San Francisco, actually. Um, and so what I can speak to is um, more of just like the American view of the election and, you know, and that South Asia like me and um, I really think that this, in the last few months, um, especially with the Black Lives Matter protests starting in the summertime, um, a lot of this presidency has, or this election has become about race relations more than anything. And even- Can I interrupt you for a second? I'm like, uh, could you also share your thoughts with us on how, as the youngest South Asian American in this panel, how do you personally see this election? As yeah. Teenager. Yes. Um, yeah. So, um, as mentioned, I think that this election has become a lot about race relations, um, especially. I mean, before the election year, when um, Trump has made a lot of comments that have hurt a lot of you know groups that you know Black Americans. Um, uh, undocumented people living in America. You know, one of my friends is a DACA recipient and just like seeing the way that she's stressed out about Trump, you know, wanting to take away DACA for, um, you know, people like her, it's, it's, he kind of made it about race in a way. And I feel like um, Joe Biden is, um, he's trying to show that he's not just another white man president that he is going to listen to um like you know especially with his choice with the vice president you know kamala harris she she speaks to both the black american community and also the south asian community um and i think that there was a lot of excitement actually particularly from the south asian community it's very interesting because i don't think i think be, i don't think before she became um the vice presidential nominee i don't think too many South Asians were really celebrating her too much. And then when she was announced, it was just like an outpouring of support and a lot of people excited to see someone like their own family members um, possibly being in this high office. Um, so yeah, I think I, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting for me also because I am, this is my first time also uh, covering a presidential election um, you know, when Trump was first elected, I was still in university studying, but um, now I'm working in local news. Um, and it's been interesting to see just, it's even just on the local level, you know, with um, voting and access to voting, that's been um, a major issue as well. So there's just a lot of, a lot of things that go outside of just Trump and Biden within America and the elections. Um, and yeah, I can, I can answer some questions, but that's kind of some thoughts I've had. All right, thank you very much. I think you were the last speaker. Is there anybody else who's going to speak? We don't have any more speakers, right? 
I see names here, Ghazala, Azam, Binish, Chaudhary, Nadeem Hutyana. Hutyana Sahib is going to speak, right? No, I'm going to basically, once you come to the question answer session. You will participate. Uh, then. Okay, so there are yeah, yeah. no so, more speakers. So, so if any of the speakers, they want to contribute anything else, they can take, uh, do so. But if they don't have to, we can just go for the question answer session. Yeah, if somebody wants to say something, they can. Um, I'd like to make an observation. Um, so, it, 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 I'm sorry, Nadim, just one John, observation. If I can. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. This is a, a very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting session. I think many people have said some, some things that are uh, exactly right. And it's very enlightening for me. Uh, Miriam uh, uh, made an made an observation that I think is key to this entire election and in fact going over the last uh, four years of the Trump presidency and that is that uh, if we look back further than that at the end of the Cold War there was a sort of an exhaling everybody thought well that's over now we can unite everyone and we can form a true international community we don't have to worry about communism anymore and on and on well that didn't last very long and one of the things that I think we've been looking for in this country for uh, the 20 years, for the generation that has um, since then, is the 30 years, uh, is that there would be a real effort on the part of the President of the United States to bring countries together, to unite people generally as much as it's possible. That has not happened in the Trump administration. In fact, things have gone in the opposite direction. There is now a much clearer definition of the demographics in the United States than there was previously. And the reason for that is because there is a greater degree of animosity. Uh, he has a way of presenting his own points of view that is uh, regarded by many people as divisive. Uh, that is why we have uh, this surge of sentiment and, and, the, and the reinvigoration of the Black Lives Matter movement. That's why we have uh, governors of states, big important states in this country, being so outspoken in their opposition to the federal government, that uh, the executive branch that Donald Trump leads. There's been a, a resurgence of divisiveness and a lack of unity and this has extended itself, uh, my point here is this has extended itself uh, well before now into the foreign policies of this government, uh, wanting to pull out of Afghanistan uh, is, he sees this in much more parochial terms as keeping a promise that he made because when he was running in 2016, he said, we've got to get out of these endless wars. Not a bad idea. Yeah, but, but right now, to think that there might for Pakistan, for, for China, for Europe, for Russia, uh, that's not his concern. His concern is keeping a campaign promise that he made. And that's kind of the way he looks at everything. Uh, and I don't think he really even denies that if you, if you press him on it, that it's, it's important to him, it's important to to what he wants to do so that he can make America great again, whatever that means. I don't, I don't know what that means. Uh, I've read dozens of books and I read publications all the time. I don't know really what that, what that means. Anyway, I think the point that's been made, which I think uh, is profound, is that if the world was divided before, it is now divided more so, in my opinion. And that is certainly true within the United States among people who hold differing points of view, whether it's having to do with race or the economy or the pandemic, for heaven's sakes, um, and that sort of thing. So I think divisiveness going into this election is one of the key issues that voters are going to have to decide. Thank you. Yeah, can I, can I also come in? Uh, if I'm allowed to. Yes, please, yes. please, 
Well, uh, uh, regarding um, uh, Donald Trump, I, I do share some of the uh, you know concerns that have been highlighted here. But uh, let me tell you, there's something, there, there's a broader point that needs to be made. And that has hardly anything to do with Donald Trump. Uh, at this moment, it seems that while Donald Trump was running for his office in 2016, uh, he did air a lot of things that were unprecedented or we felt that they were unprecedented. But frankly, who actually uh, has made this decision that India, uh, American media is going to go into the schizophrenic mode where uh, one side has to always come up with one narrative and the other side has to come up with the other. You know, this post-truth kind of culture that is uh, uh, permeating U.S. and then it is uh, reaching our regions as well. That is literally frightening because we are living in an age where um, creating an alternative reality might be very easy. Uh, we have seen fake, uh, uh, deep fakes where one person is saying something that he c could never s uh, say, right? Uh, I think we all need to take responsibility for where we are at. At this moment, absolutely, uh, John is absolutely right that uh, uh, this calls for the kind of uh, state of affairs that we have all over the world. It calls for a different kind of world leadership where uh, you can actually identify the common threat, for example, pandemic, and uh, uh, bind the wounds of division. But uh, regardless of that, it is, it, it, it is what we have done to ourselves, not merely Donald Trump. Are you saying, Farooq, that Donald Trump has made the international media uh, more irresponsible? I think uh, we all had that, uh, the, the seeds of irresponsibility within us. Uh, we saw a chance and we thought that it is a partisan time and we actually went crazy. Everybody has. And uh, you can see this craziness in India's media, Pakistan's media. Uh, coming back to what you were asking earlier, uh, Anwesa, uh, at this moment, if I flick, uh, switch between ARY and Geo News, you will see totally different reality. I mean, this never used to happen all over the world. So uh, if we want to attribute everything to Donald Trump, I mean, uh, we can do that. But we will have to realize, and it is a sobering thought, the age we are in, the pandemic, artificial intelligence, automation taking all your jobs, there are so many challenges which calls for a very different kind of leadership. I'm happy that at least one party has a woman uh, on its ticket, because I think that we men have actually really destroyed a lot of things, and perhaps a woman can bring some kind of uh, healing touch uh, and some kind of new leadership that we have seen in the past as well. But regardless, at this moment, I think instead of blaming Donald Trump, we'll have to look at uh, uh, what we have done in the past. And I think it is a sobering thought. Can I have one question? Can I ask Mr. Lenin? Mr. Lenin, uh, I just want to take you, uh, I'm going to raise this thing that you raised already which is uh, Trump leaving the world alone. He says that we are not, we are not policemen. It's not our job to, to do policing across the globe. So why should America do that? So can we have a question from Zafar uh, Sahib? Uh, yeah, okay. Um, I uh, heard so many nice things, but I have a, a very simple question. What this election is going to have, if any, effect on international or local environmental issues in addition to pandemic uh, we are already facing. Very good. We can, I'm, I'm not directed to any particular person. Okay, thank you. Whoever wants to ask. First, to un uh, answer to Anwar's question, I mean, if anybody can answer. Yes, I, I, I mean, anybody can answer this. Why should America yeah. be the policeman? Why should America continue to do this job, policing the world? As Trump says, this is, these are Trump's words. That, we are in Afghanistan, we are doing the job of a policeman, and that's not our job. Well, uh, if you allow me, I would like to say something here. Uh, what what, what Farrook say, I, I kind of agree with him that uh, the, the idea of a new world order and after the um, fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, 
uh, that's something we kind of created in our minds that uh, now everything will be hunky dory then the concept of globalization <laughs> came very soon we realized that uh, globalization of course uh, smoothed down the transactional relations where you have to do trade and all that however the cultural fault line and we see it in the case of china and in uh, and uh, united states you cannot overcome them. and uh, these things uh, uh, blaming only to mr trump uh, is somewhat unfair because this post truth era began just after that because george bush senior he uh, incorrectly told the world that uh, Saddam Hussein's militaries are standing on the eastern Saudi to attack on eastern Saudi Arabia. That's uh, that would that allowed uh, that kind of made the Saudi government to allow American troops sitting in the um, uh, in, in Saudi soil. Good or bad? I'm not saying that it was bad or good, but that happened. Then his son, President Bush, had the same issue. That uh, going to Iraq on the uh, you know, uh, pretext of uh, you know mass destruction weapons and all that. So that thing has been started and it was going on uh, all over. And even with the COVID came, lot of uh, places uh, it is it was said that it is is going to bring uh, people together again and uh, they will be loving each other more to help each other. But it's not going to happen. I mean, the thing is that, that it will be, these things are further creating the fault lines. I mean, you can see it. First thing what happened, China virus, China did that. No, China did not. Italians did that. You know, so this is not going to stop. I mean, we are in the world where we have to uh, stay put. Now, very quickly, why America would be the police, police person of the world, okay? America should not be a police person of the world. However, America is a big power, so it can influence. But unfortunately, America has to see its interest. Like in the case of India, Pakistan, India is their strategic interest. So America cannot be the honest broker of the peace between India and Pakistan because US has its own interest. So, uh, cannot be the police of the world. That is my understanding. Anybody else wants to contribute? Well, to this? well I, I would just say that uh, I, there's very little, there's very little support for the idea, at least as far as I'm aware, that America should be the policeman of the world. If we look at the controversy over law enforcement in the United States right now, we can sort of understand why because that's not a good position to be in, and ultimately uh, it's a losing position. It's a defensive position uh, un until it's reformed. So that, that's not the issue. The issue really is, uh, a, uh, it's captured in a question which does have an answer for a lot of people. What should America's role in the world be? Uh, I think Donald Trump would say, uh, make America great again. That's not the answer. That's not, that wasn't the question. That's, those are, those are two different things. And uh, I think evidence of Trump's uh, view of America's role in the world uh, is explicitly laid out in some of the decisions that he has made. To pull out of the World Health Organization in the middle of a pandemic, to pull out of the Asia Pacific uh, Trade uh, Agreement, which was a multinational agreement intended to counter the influence of China. He pulled away from that. He pulled out of that trade agreement. Uh, he, he is not a big fan of the United Nations in any of its activities. He also, uh, regional activities, uh, NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, he pulled out of that. So he is, he's, in, in some ways, I think if he is reelected, we will see an increasing isolation of the United States in terms of foreign affairs. And the flip side of that is one that I think a lot of people have uh, disliked very much, which is 
you know, he looks at China and he looks at Xi Jinping, uh, who has taken extraordinary measures uh, to prolong his rule over China into the years ahead. Uh, uh, Vladimir Putin has done the same thing in Russia. These are America's two largest, uh, you, could, you might call them foreign adversaries. Vladimir Putin has worked with the Duma, the Russian parliament, to extend his rule over Russia and it, it, longer perhaps than either one of those two leaders uh, will be alive. Donald Trump kind of likes that model. And he said facetiously, uh, you know, I, I, next eight, 12, 20 years. So that's in, in a way, he, whether he's being facetious or not, in a way that captures his view of international affairs which on a global basis uh, is seen as unconstructive. It is antithetical to the purposes of the federal government in the United States over the last two generations. Uh, going back, in fact, to the end of World War II, when the United States has spent trillions of dollars uh, to try to bring people together again. Uh, and so it, it, I think his, his view of, of the United States, uh, I'm sorry, his view of, of globalism and uh, international uh, does not bode well uh, for uh, efforts in that direction. We'll see what would happen if Joe Biden is elected. If Biden elected, I just term in office trying to influences uh, of the last administration within this country, trying to bring American citizens back together again. And I don't, I, frankly, I don't, I, I would love to hear what the rest of the group has to say about uh, the views of South Asia by either one of these two candidates and whether or not there's any hope to try to, to bring unity there, uh, not, in, not just in South Asia, but with the United States and, and, and Western Europe, perhaps. Thank you. Yeah, anybody from South Asia, I mean, Mr. Patafi, you can respond to Mr. Zafar's answer. Uh, yes, I think um, I would like to take that up. Um, unfortunately, the elections are not governed by agendas and they are primarily uh, uh, designed in a way we've seen uh, globally elections are now designed bases personalities more than agendas and Trump is is a shining example of how you can influence people by uh, your theatrics and not by what you intend to do but as far as uh, the question on environment is concerned I think uh, this is make and break for climate uh, climate change globally uh, Trump has ridiculed and made fun of a lot of people including the scientists he has rubbished the whole idea of uh, the, 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 the whole idea of using fossil fuels for the next few decades. He has withdrawn from the Paris Climate Change Agreement. And there's a lot of disaster that is expected to happen. And if you compare this with, with, the, uh, with the Biden's whole, uh, whole uh, you know, he has laid out a chart for, for uh, the climate change policies if he is elected. So clearly, as far as the climate change uh, uh, agenda is concerned, the only way we can see something moving is, is, is to ensure that Trump doesn't uh, come back to power because uh, he, uh, his plan, the entire, the, the, if you see the entire government plan has been to really not talk about it and not bring this into focus. Every conversation has been about that. So therefore, for us to seriously take up climate change, I feel that we will continue in these four years of Trump will ensure that we continue to use fossil fuels for the, for the next couple of decades. And the scientists uh, and the rallies who are, uh, you know, fighting for climate change are really keeping their fingers crossed that we need somebody who is sensitive and sensible enough to understand uh, what the world is going through. The wildfires that we, the, the, the world has recently seen is, a, is an example. And there's a, there are a lot of signs uh, globally. So yes, uh, the question, def, it, it, the, to me clearly, if it's about climate change, we know whom to vote. 
Okay. Right. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Sahab, uh, since you actually mentioned me as well, if you allow me, I can. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Right please, now. please. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, regarding uh, climate change, that's why Greta uh, Thunberg has actually endorsed uh, Donald Trump. But I believe that science has its own way of reshaping things and conversation. Uh, whether you like wearing a mask or not, uh, the pandemic is forcing everybody to wear it, right? So climate change might also be able to have an impact in coming days on the policy debates and it can reshape everything regardless of who you are, where you stand. But uh, coming back to the question about policemen, I, as a student of uh, international relations and international history, when I trace back this idea of policemen, I go back to FDR. FDR, who used to talk about four policemen, and at this moment, exactly. uh, you'll be surprised to notice the the four people, the countries that we talk the most: mm -hmm. China, Russia, uh, uh, UK, and America. Uh, they is. they still are, I mean, very relevant at this moment. Right. I think uh, I think somebody. Mm -hmm. I, uh, uh, right. Uh, regarding all these circumstances, uh, mm, I tell you, yeah. when it comes oh, to the yeah. idea yeah. of uh, yeah. uh, leadership of the world, uh, when it is leadership of the world, I actually go back to the idea of uh, 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 Reagan. That was a shining city on a hill. I think America as a role model can really be a great influence on everybody. And if we are looking at that kind of situation, uh, if America, instead of wasting a lot of energy on the entire world, if it focuses more on fixing itself, I think in the longer run, we will be uh, really grateful. Remember, for 20 years, everybody was talking about Afghanistan and how Afghanistan, uh, American forces should quit Afghanistan. Uh, I'm talking about Pakistan, how these things were being discussed there. But amazingly, Ever since we have heard about a withdrawal of the U.S. forces, now everybody who was talking about stabilizing Afghanistan without U.S., they keep on reminding you that maybe the U.S. should be there, uh, for at least till the time there is some kind of a peace deal, right? So America has a role whether you like it or not. But at this moment, uh, because the stock of democracy is falling, my concern right now is that America actually heals itself and keeps it a, a tad bit low when it comes to the noise because we need signal and we need inspiration. Ji. Thank you, Pitafi. Any other question? Yes, I have one. We have, we have seen, we were talking, uh, most of the we have, people we were talking yeah. about Mr. Trump. I don't agree with his policies, but my question is, uh, is it possible that only president can do anything? Because I, what I have seen, President Trump, he, he has a personality to connect to people. But unfortunately, he's connecting to only one segment of the society. He, can, he could have been connected to other people also. The other thing is, if, he, uh, if the president has all authorities to do everything without his advisors, is it possible? for any president to do anything he wants to do, just like an, author, uh, uh, like an uh, authoritarian president? Is it possible? Because I think he has bad advisors also. So who is going to answer? Um, I can take one. Yeah. Um, so what I've been seeing is that you know, Trump is getting a ton of support by the people who are supposed to keep him in balance and are supposed to check his power and the, you know, the House and the Senate, you know, they're supposed to be, um, you know, making sure that the president isn't unwielding too much power that, you know, that is, remains unchecked. Um, unfortunately, it seems that, you know, while the House is more um, democratic controlled, it's, you know, they had the whole impeachment trials. I mean, the House impeached President Trump. Um, and then unfortunately with the Senate, you know, it's mostly Republicans and they appear to just be going along with um, everything that Trump is doing. They don't, 
rather than, um, you know, realizing, you know, some things that he says is he's advising against public safety guidelines during this pandemic. You know, he's showing up to events without masks. He, <laughs> right after testing positive for coronavirus, he's, he's saying that he's going to participate in a debate before anyone knows even what, how contagious he is. Um, so it seems that, you know, in the Senate, a lot of, just a lot of the Republican lawmakers that are supposed to, you know, uh, check his power, they're just kind of, they're attending those events with him. They're also appearing without masks. They're hugging each other, sh shaking hands, you know, they're enabling him and enabling these things that he's saying and they're not, uh, it's, it's like they're more concerned with keeping a Republican president in power regardless of what he's doing um, than having a president that would, um, you know, be concerned with the well-being of, its, of the Americans. Um, so from what I've seen, it seems like what he say, says has been, has been su widely supported and the people that um, are trying to do something about it, you know, um, like the Democrats in the House and um, the few Democrats that are in the Senate, um, they, they're left without much power just because there are, there are more Republicans in the Senate and then they're allowing things to continue. Yeah, Anwar, you wanted to say something? Short comment. Yes. Just one short comment of uh, Nodera's uh, point. Uh, reading the book by uh, Mr. Woodward, uh, The Fear, it doesn't seem that Mr. Trump needs a lot of advices from the advisors. I mean, he does a lot of things at his own. I mean, he doesn't listen to uh, his advisors in so, in so many times. So, of course, uh, we don't know where the wrong decisions come, uh, the, it, it, the only time will tell. Historian will write about it. Yeah, and what? Seem to be focused on South Asian issues related to South Asia. I um, mean, Trump's behavior, environment, and all these issues are discussed on American television all the time. I think, the, I think the main purpose of this discussion is to focus on the issues that are not discussed in the mainstream media. So, and uh, I think it will be a good idea if there are other people like C.B. Nishabri, Rajesh, uh, if they would like to say something about how Indian Americans and Pakistani Americans, what they think of, of, uh, of this election and uh, how they see this election impacting, impacting their lives in this country and having an impact on Pakistan and India. Thank you, Anwar Sahab. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, in my um, community, social worker and social activists community, there is a lot of unrest and a lot of disappointment uh, present. And uh, the people I interact with, mostly they are the underprivileged people. However, they are the clientele and constituencies I work with have a lot of disappointment again. But even within the professionals and um, not only Indian Pakistani, but other communities, Spanish, Arabic, and German Chinese communities I work with, uh, the most common uh, dichotomy right now is the, the candidate, the presidential candidate. And we have all, I mean, most of uh, us have observed that the presidential candidate who has been president for the last four years does not care much for foreign policy, the healthcare issues, the financial stability of the country, or and or uh, other uh, minorities present in the country. So first of all, I find a lot of disappointment and unrest among um, different minorities present in this country. Um, However, people do not talk openly against him or for him. And that makes me kind of upset that, uh, and raise the question that, do they not care? Or are they that disappointed that nothing is going to happen even if there is a question or even if they talk? So most of these uh, uh, perspectives that whether you talk or whether you don't talk, 
you feel like nothing is going to happen. I apologize. I got caught. So I, I, I mean, my daughter, um, my older one, she is um, working at a staff attorney. She started working as a staff attorney currently, and we meet with the people who are um, professionals who are practicing law and social, other social activists. Most people talk about that Donald Trump is not a right candidate, and so is Joe Biden. He is little overaged and by personality, by policies, he is far more better candidate. But a lot of Americans do not think that he can actually deliver the message. He can actually take care of the country and the problems. So I think the whole nation is at a, uh, at a, divi at a very divisive point right now. And these, uh, the media, um, I don't know, some of, some of you are uh, mostly directly involved with media, but I also would like to say that media is not doing a responsible job uh, in covering the election because I, a lot of uh, confusion created by media uh, locally and globally uh, regarding the policies, regarding the, um, the issues of this election, which is going to happen November 3rd, so however, whoever I'm going to vote, I'm also not very certain that my vote will be counted. That's the uncertainty I'm feeling. And feeling that in a lot of other people, the same uncertainty, sort of a disappointment that nothing, nothing might happen, nothing might change. So I would like to, maybe in our next meeting, I would love to talk about the things, what will, what will go wrong during this election or after this election? What could go wrong? What if President Trump will become the president for another four years? Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, I would like to say something about the elections that, um, that are like very important. Looking at the Trump and Joe Biden, I still feel the same. Both of them are not strong candidate. Um, should I vote for Joe Biden, even though I'm a very loyal Democrat? So obviously I will stick with them, but I'm like looking at the pros and cons. And when I see their debate, when I see their policies and I compare, I'm like, uh, I think we should go with Joe Biden. There's a little bit of hope, bringing a Trump back uh, in power, things gonna get more messy. <laughs> And it's, um, it's difficult because right now the candidates are not strong, either team. Joe Biden is great, but if he does become a president, does he, is he going to have a power to deliver our message like Fulzia mentioned earlier? So these are the things that are like there. Um, we still got like a few more weeks. We're still looking uh, very closely to see what's, you know, what they're going to offer. The promises I am seeing the last minute ones are like, to me, those are just a tactic to buy votes from people. Like they just like, are in my opinion, they're like bribing at this point. <laughs> so when I see that, I'm like, okay, this just not very promising. I mean, I don't see a bright future, but I don't wanna get stuck with the four year term. So I wanted to see beyond the four years. So if I look beyond the four years, I will say Joe Biden is, um, is winning at this point. But if I wanna see the four, like a four year term, both of them are not good candidate. But um, again, we gotta, you know, look beyond the four terms. We gotta look at our children future. Um, I'm very excited uh, seeing Kamala Harris being part of the Democrats. And that's like a hope. That's like a, like a light there. So maybe things are changing. Maybe Joe Biden comes and Kamala Harris is right there. Things gonna get better, especially for women. So I'm excited for that. <laughs> I am there, I'm supporting them. So obviously I will be um, voting. That's my personal opinion. I will be uh, voting for Joe Biden. And for the rest of you guys, I will say, do your homework, pro and cons, check to see uh, which, is, uh, which uh, candidate is going to benefit for down the road, like for long term, not just for the four years term. So that's pretty much at the moment. And this is my first time attending this meeting. So I wasn't prepared. <laughs> so I'm listening and it was like good to hear a lot of different opinions from different, like all over the world. And it was like nice seeing and meeting all of you guys. Thank you. Thank you.
I can see you, Mr. Raza Rumi on the screen. Raza? Uh, well, first of all, thank you uh, for inviting me, Dozera Saiba and the other organizers. So, I mean, I'm listening to uh, the various um, predictions and uh, aspects of the US election. I think uh, it is still very unclear, even though the polls are putting Joe Biden ahead of uh, Donald Trump. But if you remember in 2016, this was exactly the case. And even until the last election day, everybody had predicted and uh, decided that Hillary Clinton would be the next president. Uh, but we saw that there, there were a real incons inconsistencies with the polling data and the polling systems, you know, which uh, uh, surprised and shocked everybody, not just in the US, but globally. So I think this time as well, we should not be relying completely on, uh, <clears throat> on the polling data because the polling uh, uh, data is, uh, has always limitations in the way uh, it is assessed and presented. Uh, the reality is that uh, there are many factors uh, which will um, unfold in the next three weeks. The first important uh, factor has to do with the voting rights. So we also know that there's a voter suppression, which is also embedded in the US uh, political culture. Uh, particularly with respect to the minorities and the African-American population. Uh, in many states, uh, there have been laws and uh, different rules and devices uh, which keep the Black American vote uh, suppressed or um, away from the ballot box. Uh, similarly, there are, uh, there are issues with the mailing system and there's been on ongoing debate. So the, you know, the idea is that the Democrat Democratic voters are likely to send their vote by mail, while President Trump's loyal base is going to perhaps go out and uh, physically and vote without because they don't really care about masks, as Fazia was mentioning, or some somebody earlier was mentioning. And uh, so all these factors are still very um, make make this a very close race and a very uh, difficult um, election. Uh, of course, it's a very important election for America and, and the world because uh, if uh, Donald Trump wins again, then his uh, strategy of uh, disengaging uh, with the world will continue. We know that uh, the current administration has uh, backed off from many UN conventions, uh, uh, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, uh, many other international uh, obligations that uh, the U.S. had signed up earlier. Uh, and uh, similarly, this kind of uh, in, uh, inward-looking uh, U.S. policy is likely to continue with uh, mainly the focus on uh, the key interests. And coming to South Asia, I think, uh, well, for, for, uh, I mean, for South Asia also, there's not going to be a major policy change if either of the two get elected. Uh, because it is very clear that the long-term alignment of the United States is with India, uh, given the trade relations, the investment opportunities, the companies uh, uh, that are keen to uh, invest uh, in India. And uh, pa for Pakistan, uh, Pakistan matters in the short term because of the Afghanistan situation. Trump was very keen to pull out of Afghanistan with Pakistan's support. Of course, that process is uh, ongoing and is unfolding with the talks with Taliban uh, gaining more and more traction. But, um, uh, you know, what if Joe Biden takes place? I don't see any major difference. Maybe the pullout timetable might be revised slightly uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, but overall, there's fatigue with the Afghanistan war and it's going nowhere. So any administration which takes charge is going to pursue the same policy. So I think uh, for, with respect to South Asia, uh, we need to remember uh, that uh, this is also a changing uh, global power alignment because the rise of China in Asia and uh, in the recent years is now a, is, is perceived by US policy circles as a major threat in the coming years. And Pakistan's position is very delicate because Pakistan is an ally of the US for decades. At the same time, Pakistan is, is uh, overtly in Chinese camp, 
uh, with the China, with the uh, China Pakistan economic corridor and all the investment agreements. So Pakistan will have to tread a very careful balance in keeping both these uh, relationships going and intact. Uh, so on, uh, so that will be a test of uh, Pakistan's le leadership, its uh, policymakers, uh, more than perhaps whoever is in the White House. Uh, the real impact of uh, this election is going to be felt and realized by the Americans themselves, because in, by with another Trump of uh, with another Trump administration, some of the tasks uh, that he has uh, he had initiated the laws on immigration, the draconian rules separating children from parents, building the walls, uh, denigrating, uh, you know, uh, uh, migrants and people of color, calling uh, refugees as snakes. This is going to continue. So we should be under no, uh, under no uh, false impression. And that will have impact and implications for the US society where we have nearly 40% of the population, uh, what is known as the ethnic minorities or non-white uh, primarily. And uh, how far uh, would this, uh, uh, this presidency, uh, another presidency uh, be challenged or resisted? I mean, you know, it, is, it remains to be seen currently. Joe Biden is a compromise candidate between the center, the centrists in America and the right um, and the right uh, leaning uh, uh, you know constituencies because Joe Biden is no revolutionary or no uh, you know uh, he has a very mixed and checkered re record so while when people do uh, I guess a lot of Democrats and a lot of people are supporting him because they don't want Trump back but in reality what we have to really assess is how is Joe Biden how will he be? Uh, how is he going to be any different? I mean, yes, with the vice president Kamala Harris, a woman of color, that will be a remarkable victory for non-white uh, population of America. But at the same time, uh, uh, vice president uh, uh, designate uh, Harris's record is not encouraging at all. Uh, she was a brutal prosecutor, and her crackdown on communities of color is well documented and well known. So I think, uh, I think what uh, in this presidential race, the real chance for transformation and change was with the rise of Bernie Sanders that sadly uh, has been lost. And it has been lost because the Democratic Party establishment and the centrist opinion in the United States, which uh, does not want major shakeup or major changes to occur, uh, that particular moment has been lost, at least for now. Now it may come back uh, after the election in the, in the coming years, we, we shall see how it pans out. Uh, but at the moment, it is a close call and it is very difficult to determine who's better or who's worse. <laughs> That's my view. Reza, can I ask just one question and it will be the last question. And that is that Mr. Patafi and Ms. Saima from India, they both mentioned there is lack of interest in US inter uh, elections right now. I remember, I mean, in the previous election, a lot of media teams used to come to America to cover the event. It might be because of the pandemic, but they are mentioning that even in the America, uh, Indian, Indian media and Pakistani media, there is no mention of the election. So what could be the possible reason? I think there are, I mean, first reason, of course, uh, thank you, Hotiana Sab, and it's good to see you uh, after a yeah, long yeah. time on, on Zoom. Yeah. Uh, so I think the first um, uh, factor, of course, as you mentioned rightly, is COVID-19 and the pandemic, where a lot of uh, media houses would not like to take the liability, or uh, if somebody falls ill and sick. And as you know, in the in the U.S., if you are a visitor, if you don't have medical insurance and you get mm -hmm. a serious ailment, you will die, because there is there are no uh, there are no public health facilities as such unless you are fully insured in this country. So that, that's one factor. But I think other than that, both India and Pakistan are mired in a very difficult domestic uh, political positions. Uh, I mean, Pakistan more so, as we know, as we are talking, there's a big rally in Karachi uh, underway against the setting government. Uh, it, is a, 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 it is an alliance of all the opposition parties from the right to the left, and they have uh, ganged up to 
dislodge uh, Imran Khan's uh, current government. So all media attention, uh, public opinion's attention is focused on that as we speak. In India as well, uh, I have noticed that there's very few uh, teams visiting. And I mean, I know one journalist who's, who's, uh, who's here who, who, who got in touch with me. But other than that, I haven't really seen any major interest. And partly that has to do with the fact, well, first of all, it is a bit embarrassing because Prime Minister Modi came to, in, uh, to, to the US, uh, held Donald Trump's hand and addressed a thousands, uh, uh, you know, rally of thousands of Indian Americans and somehow uh, projecting that this Indian American vote is going to go into Trump's uh, jholi, as we call it South, in, in South mm -hmm. Asia. But the reality is that we know now, now through the surveys that nearly 60 to 70 percent of Indian Americans are likely to vote for Biden given the policies of visas and immigration that are hurting the Indian professionals who come here. And of course, the fear of uh, rising racial tensions in the future, if uh, the white supremacist uh, discourse is allowed uh, to, to continue in the United States. So I think that's the other factor. But I think more, most importantly, Indian, uh, India also knows that whatever uh, happens, whether it's Trump or Biden, uh, they exactly know that uh, uh, India is perceived as the counterweight to China in the region. So for them, it's not really an earth shattering uh, election, you know. So that as, I, as I mentioned earlier that, you know, this election will have ramifications. Yes, there will be global ramifications because Joe Biden at least will put uh, America back on the international stage because Donald Trump has withdrawn. I mean, that's his policy. That's what his support base wants. They want America first, quote unquote. They want to make America great again. Mm. They want uh, all, all their popular sloganeering is about domestic, American, uh, economic and political uh, situation, particularly that of the underprivileged white working class that has been impoverished, that has lost its income and assets. You know, so Donald Trump's base is not just about race. We should remember that Donald Trump is, uh, Donald Trump is also articulating the interests of the white Americans who have been left behind in the economic progress over the last four decades. The income inequality in the, in the United States is at its peak after, after a century. For a century, in the, uh, just after and before the Great Depression, you had such levels of income inequality in America. And it's only after a century that it has peaked. And Donald Trump is in cashing on that. A lot of uh, these uh, populist leaders uh, who have these uh, slogan areas, slogans of making their countries great again, actually in cash on this income inequality and uh, this feeling of disquiet within their countries. You know, look at Hungary, look at Brazil. Uh, to some extent, PM Modi in India also has given the economic dream to a lot of middle classes in India. That's why not everybody votes for Modi because he's a Hindu Tava, uh, you know, leader or champion. They vote for him for a better future, for, a, uh, for jobs, for employment. And same is happening in America. So, so I think uh, at this stage, we, uh, we are really in a very, uh, uh, you know, uncertain situation here. And uh, certainly, uh, it, is, it is quite clear that whatever is going to happen on November 3 and thereafter will, will have the first um, a direct impact on American society, its stability, and, um, and its um, interracial harmony. Thank you. Can I ask for uh, Mariam Sabi, please conclude the session. Mariam? Yes, um, thank you everybody for joining us. This was very enlightening. Um, I just want to thank all of the guests on behalf of uh, Global Beat Foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Farooq Sahab. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank and Faza, Misba, Fariha, Zafar, Maryam, everybody, Anwar, Hotiana Sahab, everybody. Thank you very much. John, of course. So thank you, everybody. And inshallah, we'll see you in some next function. <laughs>